Welcome back everybody. This video I produced months ago and I just never did release it. Now, I went back and reviewed it a few weeks ago and realized that the edits just aren't quite exactly where they should be. So I've gone back in and changed things as best I can, but it's still a little bit choppy compared to maybe some of my more recent videos. But anyway, with that said, let's get this Garmin set up on the bike. You know, I've always enjoyed using a Garmin Nuvi GPS on my power sports, both my snowmobile and this DR. But there's one thing that has always driven me nuts about them, and that is the fact that at the most inopportune time, it's going to jump into sync mode if you're just using it off a USB charger. Now, for years I had no idea how to solve this, but I think I have a fix now that I can take out and get it running um, smoothly and solidly when I'm out in the field. So we're going to modify a USB cable today on Dino's Tinker Shed. Stick around, it's going to be fun. I know what you're thinking. Garmin Nuvi, that's not really um, a power sports GPS to begin with. They're really designed to work in a car or a light truck and you're correct about that. They're not really designed to be an all-weather product, but I'll be honest with you, I've been using a Garmin Nuvi on my snowmobile for the better part of five years now, and they do have a lot of advantages. The first one is I had a Garmin Nuvi um, already in my possession. We bought it years ago, and we stopped using it because our truck and our Jeep both have GPS navigation built in, so it was just sitting around. It was free, essentially. The other great thing about Garmin's is they have a micro SD slot, so it was easy enough to plug in a trap ma uh, track maps uh, GPS card into that, and all of a sudden the entire 30,000 kilometers of snowmobile trails were available to me on a on a device. It was fantastic, um, and it's proven to be relatively durable. I actually replaced my original track maps two years ago, thinking it was starting to fail because it was constantly jumping into sync mode on me and I couldn't get it to, to run proper. So I bought a new one, plugged the track maps into that one and it was doing the same thing. So it ended up actually being the SD card went for a bit of a, a crap. So I ordered a new track maps, updated and it works fine on the new system. Um, but I still have this issue that when you buy one of these, they come with either uh, a cigarette lighter adapter or they come with a power plug that plugs into the wall to charge them. So that's great and fine if you have a cigarette plug in your car or on your motorcycle, but I don't. I actually have a USB plug on my motorcycle. And what happens is when you plug that USB cable into that uh, USB plug on the bike or my snowmobile, it makes the Nuvi feel like you're plugging it into a computer. It's looking for data and it eventually drops into sync mode. And once it drops into sync mode, it will sometimes run for me and other times it will lock up and it usually locks up in the most inopportune places, um, somewhere up north of Sudbury or Blind River or uh, North Bay or Cochrane. And you're kind of left out in the middle of nowhere. Now we always would carry backup maps, but it was still frustrating with the fact that when you really needed that GPS, it was in sync mode. So for a, for a few years, I was extremely frustrated with it. And then I happened across a, a YouTube video, actually, that talked about how to solve this. And that's what we're gonna try to do today. We're gonna try and circumvent the data cable within the USB, the, the, the actual data lines within the USB cable and see if we can't make a custom cable that works with my bike and with my snowmobile and stabilizes um, the GPS unit so it only charges. Okay, let's get started by looking at the USB cable. 
So what we're going to try to do today is actually um, take this USB cable, I'm going to cut it and open it up and um, remove the data cables from the device. So hopefully that will make it charge. Now let's cut this open, we'll strip it. These are cheap, if I wreck it, I really don't care. A lot of videos that I've watched on this actually strip the cable back they, they try to preserve the power cables. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to really just cut this in half like so. And I'm going to strip back all the sheathing on here to see how it works. I don't even know if this will work or not, but we're going to try it. Um, there we go. That, that worked. And then I'm going to solder these connections back together. Okay, so now... I have that foil off of there. I'm just going to gently peel this back with a razor knife and see what we have here. We should have four colors. We should have, a, I think, a red, a white, a black, and a green, I think. There we go. So, that looks pretty good. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to um, take the red and the green right away. I'm not even going to use those, and I'm going to re-splice the um, the white and the black and we'll see if this will actually work and this is where things went off the rails the first time many of you probably know the red cable that I cut is the power feed for the USB the white and the green are actually your data cables now I correct it later in the video but sometimes I swear I should just stick to cleaning stuff. I might strip that back a little more, but I'll see. I'll try to rewrap those in that aluminum there afterwards. So to strip those, it's going to be a little bit tricky. Oh, and there's a ground wire there as well. Or is that the? It might be a. That might be a strain relief. Anyway, we're gonna we're gonna try this. I'm gonna see if I can strip these. The easiest way I've ever found. There we go, there's one. And let's see if I can get that red one stripped as well. I know that's bizarre that that's the way I strip the wires, but that's the way I strip the wires. All right, so now I need to do the same thing on this side. And I'm going to leave even a little more if I can on here. And the reason I'm doing that is I need to put some heat shrink tubing on this to seal it. There we are. All right. Just to make it a little easier for you to see what I'm actually doing with these very small gauge wires, I thought maybe we would use a little bit of, of 14 gauge ground wire. And that way I can make it a little bit bigger, I'll get a little better shot for you, and you can see exactly what I'm doing when I'm splicing these wires together. Okay, so the way in which we're going to do this is we're going to strip two pieces of wire off of here. So I'm going to do that with these wire strippers. I'll make this a little bit longer than it needs to be. Now, I'm going to spin the wire to braid it. Just like that. And then I like to hit it with a little bit of flux at this point. So this is just... Um, that acid flux paste that we talked about and this just cleans that wire any goo that might be on it now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually make a 90 degree bend on this side and a 90 degree bend on that side and you'll see they're about halfway down they're not perfect and I interlace these and then you start to twist it nice and cleanly all the way down like this so this is how they used to my understanding anyway is how they used to connect telephone uh, before they had telephones uh, telegraph wires so that is a journeyman splice we're gonna make it stronger by soldering it now my father-in-law and my brother-in-law and one of my nephews are pipe fitters and my other brother-in-law is an electrician. <laughs> They're all tradespeople. 
My father-in-law taught me uh, how to solder copper pipe and it's no different soldering wires. I'm gonna clean the tip of my of my soldering iron here and I clean it on that brass plug there to get all the old crap off of it. And now I'm gonna retin that. So I'm gonna hit it with a little bit of solder here or a little bit of flux, sorry. And I'm gonna tin that with a little bit of fresh solder. See how easy that goes? Now, what my father-in-law told me was you always heat the back side of what you're trying to solder. So I'm going to go underneath it here because the solder will flow towards the heat. It'll heat up enough that it'll draw that solder right in. There we go. Now again, we're going to do this on a small, small scale with those wires. Now I could probably get a little bit more um, solder over to the ends there. It's not quite perfect. But it gives you a demonstration of how strong and how secure that splice will be when we hook up our USB cable. Okay, now that we've done it large scale, I've twisted up the wires and I'm just going to hit them with a bit of flux here. Um, I'm going to heat from below and watch how fast the solder actually flows here. The wire is so thin, it almost instantly transmits the heat to the wire and it flows out to the ends really well. Now I'll do the same thing here on the red side and keep an eye on the shrink tubing up near the clamp and the insulation on the right hand side. The heat goes so fast it actually darkens that insulation and it's hard to see but it even shrinks the end of that shrink tubing a bit and it was hard to get over. Now I'll slide the shrink tubing over each individual cond conductor and shrink that tubing down nice and tight. Now some people use a match or a lighter but I find that a heat gun works best. I'll slide over the larger insulation over the whole job and shrink that down uh, nice and tight to make it waterproof. Now, even though I did a good job on the soldering here, I still ran into some other problems that I'll just talk about now. So what I think I've learned is I soldered all this together, plugged it in, and it was still going into sync mode. So I did a bit of reading and one of the sites that I read said to join the green and white wire on the um, mini USB side. They loop the data cable basically and see if that works. So I'm going to try that. I'm going to re-solder all these wires back together and then we'll see if it works. This project turned out pretty good. I had a little bit of a setback um, when I first didn't connect the data wires, but it seems to work now really well. I don't know if this is the right way to do it. It works good on my bike and the GPS that I have. Now, interesting enough, my older GPS still goes to the sync mode. The new one doesn't. It goes straight to the uh, charge mode and works perfectly off the USB now. So this is a fun little project to do and it's not that expensive. You can pick up these um, mini USB cables at the dollar store for like $1.25. So it's worth monkeying around and seeing if you can get your GPS to work. Now again, this isn't really intended to be an outdoor GPS, but it does work. I've been using them now for a few years um, and even if I have to replace them, they're like $100. And I like the size of the screen on them. They seem to work pretty well. So I encourage you to go out, have some fun in your shed or your garage or in your backyard if you have to. But get out there and learn something. It's a lot of fun. Until next time, I'm Dino and I'll see you again soon on Dino's Tinker Shed.